is the I Am Rappaport Stereo Podcast, live. You're down with Rappaport, yes I am. 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 You better tune in, I am Rappaport.com. Cause every single podcast, you know he drops bombs. I seen him on set, a seasoned vet with true talent. Catch him on his way to CrossFit, rocking the new balance. He asked me to do the track, cause he know I rhyme elite. But I'm just waiting for the Robert, Robert De Niro line, line of the, of the week. week. Breakfast of champions, toasted bagel, cream, cream cheese, and locks. This is I am Rappaport. The show never stops. You might catch him out in public, stretching his knees. But if you don't listen to the show, yo, wiggle, wiggle please. please. Wiggle, 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 please. please. This is the I Am Rappaport Podcast. What's up? This is Michael Rappaport. You are now listening to the I Am Rappaport Stereo Podcast. On today's podcast, it is a all wild, wild country I Am Rappaport Stereo Podcast. I have the directors of the Netflix documentary series, Wild Wild Country, which I am obsessed with. Is If you haven't seen it, I cannot recommend it any stronger. It's bugged out. It's crazy. It's wild. It takes twists and turns. I happened upon this six-hour docu-series, which is on Netflix. Again, it's called Wild Wild Country. Today, I have the directors, two brothers, Chapman Way and McLean Way. We're talking about the making of this film, uh, what happened now since the making of the film, what it takes to actually make a documentary, the dedication, the ground and pound, all that and more coming up on a brand new Wild Wild Country I Am Rappaport Stereo Podcast. Miles Jordan, let me get something real funky. Let's just jump into this. Okay. I'm so excited to have you guys here. Um, I think the listeners who are going to listen are excited because um, this is the wild, wild country I Am Rap Horse Stereo podcast uh, with the Way Brothers. We're here. We're here. Thanks for having us on, man. Oh, man. Come on, man. I'm excited. I uh, The directors of Wild Wild Country, um, I'll say the newest Netflix documentary series that is sort of sweeping the nation. You know I mean? It's... You know, and I know you guys, you know, you're humble about it, but I mean, it's, it's really caught on. It was just released. Um, I talked a lot about this uh, um, film on the podcast right after I saw it because I was just like, what the fuck? And, you know, <laughs> it's hard to articulate really what the movie's about because it's so long and it covers so much. And, it's, and I was just so enthusiastic when I saw it. And, uh, you know, to be honest, to have you guys here, oh, one thanks. of the, the beautiful things about a podcast is, and the internet mm -hmm. is like, you know, and, and, you know, having some sort of success and, and, and a Netflix show, I was like, I love this movie. I love this movie. And I was like, wait a minute, I got to fucking try to get these guys on the podcast. <laughs> so this is the first sort of time I've done this and, and it's two brothers. So that's awesome. Well, thanks for having us on. We want to love talking about it. I mean, this is something that we spent like four years of our life kind of making it's like you kind of have to be obsessive about these types of stories i think that like people are always like oh you guys might be tired of talking about it but i don't know we love coming on these things especially podcasts like face to face you can really like dive in and talk about stuff and it's been crazy because we made this thing just in like in in a bedroom at mark duplass's office in highland park and so it felt like so small for so long and then when it goes on netflix like globally you get the kind of an immediate reception it's been it's been pretty incredible has it been like has the the response been sort of overwhelming like i mean i guess you know when you're making it in someone's bedroom and it's the grind the ground <laughs> yeah, and pound really, of making yeah. docs you know your yeah. first doc seemed tough but this just seemed like even tougher yeah um well you made it doc i mean just to even get it to a point where the documentary makes sense is a huge hurdle i mean 90 percent just goes into making sure like can people follow the story and then to like really put in the extra time to really like make it entertaining, make it thoughtful, provocative. Um, yeah, it was a real grind for us. It took us about four years to do. How did you come about the story? Yeah. And I'm going to mispronounce uh, Raj Rajanish. <laughs> Rajneesh. Rajneesh. I already did good. once. Yeah, yeah, Rajneesh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rajneesh. I, I practice yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm going to mispronounce yeah. names, so, so please correct no me wrong. every time I, I do. I, yeah. How did the, like, the, even the origins of making this as a film in our lives come come about. So our first documentary was on the Battered Bastards of Baseball, yes. a minor league baseball team in Portland, Oregon. And yes. so we had just wrapped that up in 2014 and we worked with a film archivist who gave us the footage for the Portland Mavericks. And he was asking us, you know, what are you guys doing next for your project? And Mac and I had a couple ideas, but nothing we were like too in love with. And he basically said like, look, I've got this collection of 300 hours of archive footage on pretty much what is like the most batshit crazy story that ever happened in Oregon. 
And so he started telling us it was about this, this guru and these 10,000 followers that came here from India. They built this $120 million utopian city. They took over the, the neighboring town of Antelope. They armed themselves with, with assault rifles and bust in thousands of homeless people and ended up poisoning 750 yeah, we, people. We were almost questioning him more than and the story. We were we just like, had we had never wrong. heard of any of this. So we're like, there's no way this is true or that this happened in America because we would have for sure have known about this story. And sure enough, we kind of went back and did some light Googling and everything he had told us had happened. And so that was about four years ago and we just immediately dove in. Yeah, it was one of those things too where I think after Battered Bastards had come out, we totally made that on our own independently, financed it entirely ourselves, won a sports grant to make that like $30,000 and we got it into Sundance, which was just huge for us in our careers and showed it at Sundance and Netflix was just... They'd been doing streaming for a while, but right. like House of Cards had like just come out. And so Netflix, when, when, baseball when came, the baseball premiered at the 2014 right. Sundance Film Festival. Right. It's changed. So, I mean, it's, it, it, today you would not need to explain like what a Netflix original right, is. Or, right. But back then you kind of did. Right. Back to, then, it was like three years ago. Right. Exactly. Four, that, 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 four years that, ago. That's how much has it's changed. It's crazy. Yeah. And so Netflix was at Sundance and they bought the Battered Bastards of Baseball. And so right after that was when this story came into our life. And we were kind of getting pitched for the first time. And what we what we were getting pitched was almost always sports docs, if not baseball documentaries. Mm. And we're huge sports fans and we but love en- baseball. But enough is enough. But yeah, well, Especially we, after you finish the first doc. Absolutely. Right. We just wanted to do something differently because right. we, we see ourselves as documentary filmmakers. We want to continue to make documentaries and we didn't just want to. I love 30 for 30s, but I didn't just want to no, do I that. You. you know. And so this story came along and it was complex and sensational and it had all these what the fuck moments in it. But at the underbelly too was like some interesting complex topics that we were interested in diving in difference between a cult and a religion minority religious rights immigration bias right things like that making you know even to think people that look like redneck bigots really <laughs> listening to them and understanding what their experience was like in the story and so for us what was interesting is like the jinx had like just come out on hbo but this was still pre-making a murder. OJ made in America hadn't come out yet. Like doc series were still kind of this new emerging thing, but we knew that we had to tell this as a series. And so that was a big jump for us though. How old are you guys? I'm 31. I'm 27. Okay. All right. I'm, you have to um, excuse me because I'm going to jump all over the place. No and like I said, I'm really what, fucking excited. <laughs> and, and you know, there's so much ground to cover in my questions. And, I, and I, I've never done this. I, I, I even went on my Twitter, um, and asked if people had questions. So cool. throughout this interview, I'm going to sort of put it all together. Sure. And so what was the first 15, 20, half an hour uh, minutes of film of this archival footage that you saw that you were like, oh, shit. Yeah. The first, Do you remember yeah. like the yeah, first? Yeah, absolutely. Like, there was kind of two tapes that really stood out. The first one was when the guru, the Bhagwan, first arrives in Portland. And we put in this tape, and we see all these people dressed head to toe in red with a mala of the picture of the guru around their neck. And they're rolling out this red carpet in the middle of downtown Portland. And they're got out a dust buster, and they started vacuuming the carpet, the red carpet, and then started placing flowers down. And then there was a flutist. They had a live flutist that was playing. And then coming around the corner is this $100,000 Rolls Royce pulls up and this Indian guru walks out with this three foot beard, (laughs) three foot beard, this huge gown. And they immediately start bowing and praying to him and tears start coming down the faces of the followers. And so Mac and I were immediately just like, this is incredible. What is going on here? You know, um, and that blew us away. The second tape that we then put in was their World Festival. Every year they had this World Festival where, World where Festival. thousands of followers from all around the world would come. And it's like this insane yeah. Burning Man meets Coachella. They're river rafting. They're dancing naked. They're throwing these rave parties. Yeah, and, but I remember thinking like, oh, it looks like they've built a city in the middle of the Oregon desert. Like that this was is what, before this you, is before you, I even knew anything. Like li- before I even, I just saw the tapes and it was, I couldn't even say Roshnish Purim. I was like, you know what I mean? Right. Like I was coming to it for the first time too. And it was just, I remember my instincts being like, how many people are there? And it looked like seven to 8,000 at the world festival because these Roshnishis would come from all over the world. But then my next thing was, like I said, it was like, have they built all of this out there? And then basically, yeah, started Googling around and everything that that archivist had told us started checking out. There was this town takeover of antelope. They busted homeless people. 751 people were poisoned with salmonella. 
And then the next step that really kind of got us going full steam ahead was when we started reaching out to kind of more than just like our talking heads. They're more like our cast of characters, you know? They're kind of like the storytellers that are on the front lines of this war that breaks out in Eastern yeah, Oregon. more specifically Sheila. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you turn was the that footage... The first, did you know first, like, that's the first She person? was the first person going through the archive footage. I mean, she was provocative. She was foul-mouthed. She cussed. She didn't take shit from anyone. Um, she was just this really dynamic female leader of this group. And so we thought, wow, what a fascinating, complex character. We've got to hear kind of what it was like like for her to go through this this journey okay okay i want to get to sheila but i, I gotta back up with the yeah. fucking rolls royce because <laughs> because you know the roles like this movie this documentary film this series that you put out while i was watching it i was very like i was watching it on the edge of my seat and i was pissed off at, at b- both sides like yeah, i was yeah. like there was many times one of the things that pissed me off from the beginning was his fucking Rolls Royces. <laughs> because in my opinion, I'm like, if you're a spiritual guru, right. Right. Yeah, and yeah. you have all yeah, these yeah, followers, yeah, yeah, yeah. forget a Honda Accord, <laughs> for, for, forget a Volvo, forget even a BMW, right. to be a spiritual guru yeah, right. with a, an obsession with Rolls Royces, the dichotomy, it just doesn't yeah. make any sense. Sure. Like in this day and age, like if if you saw like some spiritual, we'd be able to yeah, document and yeah. be like, yeah. oh, we're looking at this it, fancy home. It's like one of these preachers. Yeah, yeah. You know, like totally. the, it begs the question, like, is this a con? Like, I get Like, that. what is like, this? Yeah, You're yeah, a spiritual yeah, guru, right. but you got fucking a hundred thousand right. dollar Rolls yeah. Royce. And at the end of his life, because you told me beforehand, because this wasn't, I don't think you said this in the documentary. Yeah. Ni- 93 was what he had in Oregon. Because well, when he went back to Pune, 93 Indy- Rolls Royces. <laughs> when he fled the country and they, they arrested him, 93, yeah, 93 Rolls Royces. All of the them had custom paint jobs. You should see the custom paint There's jobs. There's one for They're sale incredible. in Los Angeles for a million dollars. You can buy it. <laughs> one of his Rolls Royces. One of his Royces is called the Black Kimono. I, the Black I, Kimono. I just plugged the Black Kimono. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's available. You can Google it on. It's uh, going to go up in sales. Yeah, the the more so, this doc yeah. sort of yeah. catches life. Like, and you know someone's going to buy that fucking Rolls Royce. I think so. It's pretty crazy looking. But yeah, he was basically the first guru to like marry Western capitalism with Eastern mysticism. He was kind of the first guru to say, like, don't be ashamed of your wealth. You don't need to be embarrassed about your wealth. And so a lot of highly successful uh, Westerners kind of flocked to his ashram in Pune because they were attracted to this message of to, to be enlightened, you don't need to reject everything. You don't need to reject sex. You don't need to reject wealth. You don't need to reject alcohol. Um, you can live a, a path of enlightenment while still enjoying all those things. And he was yeah, there's really- like there's a few defenses I'll call them of like the Rolls Royces, but there's obviously like some legitimate criticisms about them too. What are the defenses? The defenses are a couple things there, and this is this is just what we heard while talking to members of Rashnish Param. One was that it was like a little more historical in that like Bhagwan was raised in India at the time of British imperialism and Rolls Royce was like a very significant <laughs> car of the British imperialist. It was like the height of accomplishment luxury of Western civilization. So I think specifically why it was a Rolls Royce was I think that there's a story of Bhagwan seeing a Rolls Royce when he was seven, eight years old. Um, but why 93 but Rolls Royce? Okay, okay, so let's, let's say we're that, going that, to that, embrace... That's not an offense. That's just why, yeah, why Rolls Royce. 93 Rolls Royce. Yeah. Like, I don't even think there's I a think, rapper alive. I think, yeah, <laughs> like, for sure. Two yeah, chains, like sure. no 50 yeah. cent, nobody in their fucking day in their yeah, hate. Floyd exactly. Mayweather doesn't I, have I, 93 Rolls Royce. I think that Bhagwan was like, I don't know if it can be talked about or diagnosed really, but there's like a collector syndrome that oh. I've come across with people with baseball cards or something like that, where it's like, you need, you have a compulsion of collecting. Cause we didn't really get into it in the documentary, but it just wasn't Rolls Royces. He had these pens, like foreign pens. Like he was obsessed with pens and calligraphy yeah, where I he would collect a ton of Rolls I really think it was more like, this is going to get press, you know, yeah, it's like true it's too. provocative. It was, it was attention. He, he was aware yeah. of it. He was the first one to be like, people aren't going to talk about my meditations that I like to do. Dynamic meditation isn't the sex topic to talk about is that what he titled it dynamic meditation that was what he invented that was like his contribution to like the world of meditation okay. but i think he thought these rolls royces it'll get me on talk shows it'll get people talking about me and through that they'll come to learn about my spiritual teaching so it was kind of what i took away from it yeah absolutely i mean he lived a really unique life on the ranch in the sense that he takes this vow of silence kind of just takes a step back so to speak just kind of chills in his awesome house on the ranch and one of his big activities that he did was he drove 
drove about two to three hours every day. He'd drive off the ranch. He'd drive to this town called Madras, which is about an hour and a half off the ranch, and then back. And that was his life that he kind of lived. I mean, other than that, it was probably the one area in the documentary that we didn't have that much footage of, which was like Baguan's day-to-day daily life. Cameramen, it was pretty much off limits to cameramen, and we didn't have a ton of footage of what his life was like, but for some reason, like his joy and kick was definitely driving around in his Rolls Royces, Okay, so- which pissed a lot of people off in Eastern Oregon, because they, right, like, like, I mean, like, these are like kind of salt of the earth people, and they're looking out their window, and for better or worse, it might be jealousy, it might be envy, it might just be confusion, confusion like, because paint a picture I'm, I'm assuming that most of the people that are going to be listening to this have watched it, but paint a picture of what the story is. The, no, the, the town looked the like show. at the okay, time. Gotcha. I mean, it's like it's, it's 19. Even when you're there, it's a town of 40 people, and then, when you're then and 40, 40 residents, and there's basically one dirt road that goes through town, and then there's kind of like one cross section that goes through town. Like it's shit. It's small town. It, it is. It's tiny town. You can't even call it a small town. Little, yeah. yeah, I mean they have a church in town that they all go to, and they have a school. And they had a cafe. They had one cafe, which is kind of like the local center. Um, but it's dirt roads, and so the image of this Indian man who they knew nothing about driving down the center of their dirt road. In these insanely expensive Rolls Royces, just got everyone riled yeah, up. It was real it quick. was the first time a Rolls Royce was ever driven to Antelope, right. and the last time a Rolls Royce will ever be driven to Antelope. Right. They, they, like, it's like Bogwan, Rashnish, and hit and then people. But yeah, basically, just to give a little background, Antelope is this tiny town in eastern Oregon. Um, it's a population of forty, and today it's around the same. But really? not, but nineteen miles away was the largest private piece of property in the Pacific Northwest. It was called the Big Muddy Ranch, and it was for sale and. And basically, this group of Indian uh, followers and American followers of this Indian mystic named Bhagwan Rashnish, they come to Eastern Oregon. They buy this piece of property, the Big Muddy Ranch, in 1981, and they rapidly spend around $120 million just turning this kind of barren wasteland of a ranch into their kind of like spiritual oasis in the desert. And it just, it, a war ends up erupting in, in Eastern Oregon. All right. To back up with Bhagwan. He's an, you call him an Eastern mystic. Mystic, mystic yeah, mystic. guru. He's a guru. I mean, how, yeah. How does someone get the, the, the classification guru? <laughs> That's a great question. Does he classify it himself? Yeah, Can yeah, anyone yeah, be a guru? Yeah, Can yeah, I say yeah, I'm a guru? Yeah, Do you have to take yeah, like a driver's test? self-proclaimed. I mean, he said he's, most people capture enlightenment right before their death is, is the usual path to enlightenment. But Guan was rare in that he said he achieved enlightenment at the age of 21. 21, he had an enlightenment experience, which is in the spiritual world very rare. He he took on the name Bhagwan, which I believe roughly translates like as mix. godly or the godly figure. Something like that was the name you know he yeah. chose for himself. And so, but yeah, India has a deep tradition of gurus. I mean, it's like, for lack of a better word, it's one of their best businesses. It's a big export that this country has had is kind of Eastern spirituality, Hinduism, Buddhism. They have strong traditions um, in but this country. But it's interesting you called it as a business. It is. It, it's definitely, it's like, it, and it, even today, there's just like huge controversies in India over what they call them godmen. Like they're godmen. Like they're kind of self-proclaimed godmen. And I would say Bhagwan definitely fits into that tradition. He was interesting in that he actually had a PhD in philosophy, became a professor, and kind of built a following of like students students of other people in Pune that would come and listen to him lecture. And then the transition was he started traveling, giving traveling lectures, which is what other professors kind of do also in the United States. But then he makes this next transition in like the early 70s where he is the self-proclaimed enlightened guru, a walking like enlightened being. And he's going to set up shop as an ashram. And an ashram is like a permanent commune that's meant for seekers, people who are walking a path of enlightenment, trying to reach enlightenment, trying to raise their consciousness, breaking out of this karmic cycle of life, death, and rebirth. And that was the core of their theology. And what about uh, their theology and their beliefs with the sexuality? Because that's one of the things on Twitter. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like, yeah. is it a fuck fest? Uh, yeah. <laughs> is, is Bhagwan fucking yeah. everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, is, yeah. like, you yeah. know, because they you talk yeah. about in yeah. the dock and you know like but it's not fully like explored eh? yeah, yeah. But, it's but, been kind of interesting because in the mm-hmm. press you know they're labeled as a sex cult so right. that immediately gets people like what is this you know what's this all about you know when we did our research like the big philosophy was he didn't believe in monogamy he didn't he believed in open marriages and so he believed if married couples come that they should experiment sexually they should find new partners they shouldn't be 
you know, uh, contained or constrained to just one partner. Um, and so in the India days, this is pre them coming to America. There are more stories of orgies, of orgies, therapy groups that, that encounter, groups. Uh, encounter groups with a lot of n people being naked and, yeah. and, and a lot I of mean, sex the, happening. Uh, uh, but the thing was like, when they came to America, they were spending so much time just building this city that all of them said like we didn't even have time to like have sex like it was so intense and so <laughs> crazy that we were like labeled this sex cult but really it was like open marriage was kind of like what we all believed in you know it wasn't like these satanic like i got you sex fests happening you know and what about Baguan? is he is he have the pick of the litter like like you know the townspeople i believe talk about the look. Right. They all had right. this look. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and and I was watching it trying to be as biased as I possibly can. And I have no judgment at the end. Right. Like, I really don't yeah, think yeah, anybody yeah. was necessarily 100% right yeah. or wrong. That's sure. a great takeaway. At the end of the film, That's I was like... That's a solid takeaway. But I, when, I, when, when you do that montage <laughs> of the look, I'm like, they they all have that look. <laughs> and, and, and to explain it to people that are listening, the look like... It's like a, they seem very happy, almost like they're hopped up. Are, yeah. are, is there drugs involved? It, and and I don't want to, because there's so yeah. many fucking questions. Was yeah. there drugs involved? Because if you said that look today, yeah. if you showed a picture right. of like somebody with that look, you'd be like, he's he's smoking some of that good yeah, shit. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. In my experience early on in the ranch and like your average everyday sannyasin was like not really on drugs. They were very Well, their whole uh, thing was health. like, you don't need drugs. Right. Like this like, is a new age community. You're coming here to feel fulfilled without alcohol, without drugs. Okay. Was the message they were selling. So they weren't selling a message of like, come here, let's drop acid. It's not like a pot. It's like, not, it's not no, like Woodstock. It that, that, yeah, but it, sure, in Pune, India in the 70s, yes, there are stories of drug smuggling. Like, and like, like, yeah. And, and but it's not like a like, big, it's not like it's not a, a weed. Tenant, it's not a part of their, their I got you. Their, yeah, their, yeah, their it's not like system. a rave or anything like that. But I would I say you. like their devotion to Bhagwan when he would drive by in his Rolls Royces was religious ecstasy i mean it's comparable to kind of like i don't know i've i've seen videos of southern baptists you know going cr like and people or just like, absolutely I losing think it's their like shit like the pope drives yeah. by you know the pope had his pope mobile and he drives right by you're you right see it and it's it's very strange it. people want see, yeah. i know it's 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 something that's hard because we struggled with it in the sense of like it's hard to intellectualize in a way that you're going to convince someone who doesn't feel that way. And at some point, we almost just ended up like taking their word for it, like that they felt this way. Like you, like you, you like the word. Exactly, like felt that way. Well, yeah, a lot you, of people are like, "Why didn't you go into the teachings? Why didn't you show this?" And it's like it's not an intellectual thing. It's yeah. it's an inside thing that these people felt. And like Max said, like we didn't feel like we could be there to judge. I mean, they all had this experience. Or like try to pick it apart. And in interesting a way. enough, we weren't able to include it, but sort of. But even like the federal prosecutors. Even people who don't believe in it were like, dude, being in a room with that guy, like, <laughs> there was something. There was some Which energy. Which is like Bhagwan. Yeah, with, with Bhagwan. Bhagwan. They with all the said that. They yeah. all, even the locals. I who mean, couldn't they, stand him. Who couldn't stand him. They all said there's like, something with it. They did that. That's like interesting. Qu it's a question yeah. of, like, if you believe that people have an inherent charisma. Like, right. There's it's some like people where Brad Pitt put walks on, in a room and everyone's like, Brad, holy yes, crap. That's like, true. Dude, Brad Pitt's here. When you're with Brad Pitt, you're like, that's fucking Brad Pitt. Or, or <laughs> Mick, sure. Jag yeah. Mick Jagger. I mean, yeah. certain people just have this energy. Leonardo that DiCaprio. Yeah. Like, when you're with Leonardo yeah, DiCaprio, you know. you're like, I can see why you're with Leonardo said DiCaprio. JFK. Like, people said JFK walked into a room yeah. and, like, you, you know could it. just feel a presence of some kind that was him. So, I mean, not that I'm equating everyone with him, but there's a celebrity, there's a projection, there's a charisma. It's a star quality of charisma. And it is true because we could do it to movie stars or athletes. Athletes or certain people. Um, okay. The ranch um, that they set up, um, it was built with $110 million. Where did, I mean, we're talking about $110 yeah. million in, in 2018 money. is a lot. Yeah. $110 million in 1981 is. Yeah, sure. I don't know what the inflation or yeah, what the rate sure. is. Yeah, well, yeah. Where does everyone's been asking? Like, where did the money come well, from? No, what we, was the to money? answer this question, though, the, the the estimation of the ranch came from at the end of the ranch when the they filed bankruptcy and they did an evaluation of what the land was worth, the buildings, how much money had been spent, right. and bankruptcy court said it was around 110 to 125 that million that. dollars. That it was th that so much money had been spent. It wasn't wow. what it ended up selling so, for because they couldn't get that on the But that was yeah. the estimation through bankruptcy proceedings. So that's where that number. That's comes from. crazy though. Uh, but, but yeah, the money, there was like pretty much two components to the money. One was he was the first guru to kind of put his lectures and his discourses on tape and books. So he had this worldwide publishing empire. I mean, they sold thousands of books around the world. And so also, some of the money was just his earned money. Just right. his earned like money. Monthly from subscription money where it's like you would buy, like not you, but like 
a Rosh Nish follower, whether they were in the ashram or in Italy or, or in Australia, Berkeley. like our Berkeley, they would buy the Rosh Nish tapes one through 30. And he, he, he gave two hour long discourses, AM and PM every day for about like 11 years when he was in ashram. Like he so was- So it's a big collection. It was like pre-Netflix well, almost. I think he you wrote over 200 <laughs> like books. It was, he was like, it he was like a subscription. Netflix. He was a subscription model. And that was, That's interesting. that was a source of income. The other big so source of income- Do you know episode. how much that was? I, we I don't, don't know exactly. In, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the I think the majority well, of the, the money- The second component was donations. I mean, these were highly successful people that came from very successful all backgrounds the all over the world. Because a lot of people that used to, they, they, that are yes. in the doc and a lot of people emptied their bank accounts. I mean, it wasn't an, it wasn't a requirement to be a part of this group. But if you people had a lot of money, felt like I'm going to live the rest of my life in this community and I want to donate my life savings to it. That was so, I, that was a perception that I don't know if we were able to totally capture in the doc series, which was people who felt. Like who donated everything to come live at Roshni's Purim, they thought they would die there. Like they thought right. it was like, they thought that we would have, they believed in this utopia that was like, I might not have a need for shelter and food. Like I'm going to be a part of a permanent commune type of living situation. Um, so I am eager to donate to this, uh, to, to, to this dream that we are all believing in. And so that was a big component. And then they would like do these, they basically had a global network of satellite communes um, that I would also kind of raise money and contribute to Roshnish Purim. And then also like they have the world festivals where it's like 10,000 Sanyasins would come and drop a lot of money to come do their because, big like, summer festivals. In our research, the money issue didn't really come up until the later years of the commune where the commune wasn't as self-sustainable as they were hoping. That's a good point. And so Sheila was really putting pressure on members to donate and mm. donate. And it definitely created some you know, fractures within that community of people feeling like, hey, I joined this for meditation and spirituality. And every time I see Sheila, she's hitting me up for my checkbook. So, and but then does the, and Sheila invest, started, the Oregonian but, investigator and she, talks a little bit about that in yeah, episode four. And in uh, Sheila's defense, she starts to talk about like when the Rolls Royces would get from 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 to 70 to 80. And now you're talking 90. It's like she was saying like, yeah, there was an expenses on the, on the community that were draining us in mm. some ways. But that, he traps right. That's more like 84, 85, 80 81, 82, 83 is kind of a little bit of a different story. Um, going to the technicalities of, of, of making the movie, which, by the way, one of the most annoying things about making any doc, especially yeah. something that spans so much time, is when people, and I'm sure you just mentioned that people ask you, why didn't you put this yeah. in there? <laughs> no, Even it, with six it, hours, it, you can't put it, everything in there. It comes from a nice place, too. I no, never I feel it, like they're interested, but, and I'm happy to talk about it. But you feel like, yeah. you know, it's like, because it, also the, the ground and pound of making a For doc, sure. and then also you need to be able to tell a story. So it yeah. might be a good thing to explain in an interview or a podcast. Absolutely. You know, I have and compassion And you need someone it. to explain it coherently on camera. Right. Right? We don't have a narrator. It's yeah. not like we can just break in, press pause, and Mac and I can narrate. You right. know, you're relying on what, uh, information we didn't have any b-roll for this and yeah. no one would interview but exactly. I, i'm the director You're constrained exactly. by it. and so. it's like in a certain sense this story was so forgotten and there was a lot of material out there but in a lot of ways like we felt like we were almost starting from scratch on this huge yeah. religious religious movement that came to eastern oregon went to war with the state it was ostensibly it's like yeah you do see sheila on ted copel and phil donahue and all these things but it's like when you're first starting out you don't know that that footage exists or that's out there you just keep on researching and talking to people and finding it and so it's like it it I, I we always talk about like we feel no ownership over the story of Roshni's Purim. If people want to pick it up and continue, like I would be the first person to read a book on it, to hear a podcast on it, to see another documentary, a documentary series on it. It oh, yeah, just I mean, kind of felt tons like with of us. things that weren't included. I mean, like you said, you think six hours, but there's so many storylines, so many characters that like hopefully the story continues because yeah. it, it is a fascinating story and there's many more stories to be told. Wait, at what point did you guys know when you started? Uh, uh, like you were like, okay, we're gonna make this. Movie movie number one where did the financing come was it was it through netflix and number two when did you decide six parts and when did you decide like there's no way this is going to be two hours yeah, sure. even at most so it's kind of like a multi-step process like mac and i are big believers in like betting on yourself so we took like the little money that we got from selling our first documentary and kind of immediately put it into this we bought cameras we started digitizing the footage we started interviewing characters, pre-interviews, not our final interviews. So like the first initial financing just came from Mac and I and my wife, Julie, who's our producer. And the three of us kind of dove in. And then after about a Which year- Which is a good thing for all young filmmakers, especially young documentary filmmakers or filmmakers in general. 
I agree. Yeah. You well, got to just wait. Your... They keep waiting for someone to knock on their door, the opportunity. The door's not getting it, knocked on. It's not on. getting knocked on. You really got it. I mean, we had a hugely successful doc at Sundance and maybe a couple opportunities here or there, but really you got to create your own opportunities. And so we immediately knew if we want to have like a, a long career, like we've got to bet on ourselves. And you have to learn how to do it. It's like learn to edit, learn to shoot, learn to do these things. You know, I think that in film. You try not to rely on too many exactly. people. Exactly. If you rely on other people to like, no, I'm going to hire a DP. I'm going to hire an editor. I'm going to hire. It's like, it's like you should learn how to do those things so you can make it on yourself and take yeah. control of your project. And then after about a year, um, through our sales agents, we hooked up with Mark and Jay Duplass, who were like huge coming on board. We knew if we were going to do this as a series, we really needed some like extra help, some extra pe- r- name recognition. Some when juice. We were, some some backing, juice to go yeah. into distributors. And and, so, but at this point, you knew this is has to be a series. We, we knew it has know. to be a series. This can't be 90 minutes. Exactly. Once we kind of started getting, basically there's three huge legal stories. There's the separation of church and state battle. There's this huge land use battle and there's this huge immigration fraud battle. And so we knew like even just diving into these topics, like it's got to be multi-form or else it's just going to cheapen the story. We can't really get into what all the conflicts are. <laughs> so within a month of research, we just knew there's no way to do this. Yeah, and hands. just the different perceptions of the same story became very interesting to us at a certain point where it's, yeah, you have perception of Roshnishis, which also also can fall into two camps, current Roshnishis and former Sunny Roshnishis, very different perceptions. Then you have the perceptions of Antelopians and other neighboring ranchers and Wasco County residents. And then you have kind of the stories of Oregon state prosecutors and federal prosecutors. Yeah, it's a lot. And all th- like all those have very different right. perceptions of the same event. And eventually, I think with the feature doc, I don't know why I think this, but I do, which is that one of those sides would have prevailed more as like your audience walking away from the feature would have been like, oh, this side was right. That side was wrong. In a series, I think we were excited by the possibility of, because we didn't really know. I mean, it seemed like both sides could be right at some times and both sides could be wrong Mm -hmm. and both sides did awful things to each other. Mm -hmm. And so in a series, that bigger canvas kind of allows you to really capture a lot of different perceptions and give everyone kind of a fair shake to tell really, the story. Which was really our pitch to Netflix. Like we told them like, this is not a traditional true crime narrative. This is not a who done it. This isn't a series based on evidence, who's guilty, who's innocent. This is really an exploration of this religious group and what led them to this It's a guru poisoning. doc. Yeah. It's a guru it's doc. It's not a murder doc. It's not a murder doc. Well, the doc, fact you know? is, is that the, I think they're actually excited by that because like the jinx had just come out and it wasn't, they hadn't quite released Making a Murder yet, but they knew that was coming out. And I think they were excited like hey this is going to be something different right. um, that we'd like to be well, a part of. The thing of. was is when we first started like w- when you google Rashi's Prum the crimes are well known and documented and people pled guilty to them so it wasn't that like who done it who's innocent who's guilty uh-huh. because that it just didn't seem like there was a lot to unravel there or reveal or mm-hmm. but it seemed like the work that we were excited by is okay how does this peace loving group who's practicing meditation <laughs> and yoga end up how do people part of this group end up poisoning 750 people? How do they end up busting in all these homeless people? How do they end up doing conspiracies to assassinate political officials? And it's that process of either how they justified that or how you know they, they can't justify it, that it was that process of almost radicalization that we were very interested in, whether that happened internally or whether that was because of external pressures put on the community. Those were like kind of some of the central questions we were interested in exploring okay. in the series. And you guys... I, I, I'm going to just continue to kiss yeah, your ass anyway. because, <laughs> by the way, is can can the film be up for an Oscar nomination or you didn't do that? I don't we, think they do it anymore. I think OJ Made in America was like the last time that was allowed. I think you have to like release it theatrically and there's a lot of qualifications. It's a little bit about the intent. It, the short answer is no, Wild Wild Country is not going to be eligible for any Oscars. But we do have like Emmys and things right, like that right. that's more TV focused. I mean... For us, like we intended it to be a documentary right, television right. series. But sometimes that was they'll, like, they'll put it in. <laughs> I think, yeah. Okay, all right. Sheila. I loved her. She fucking drove me crazy. And I'm like, <laughs> is this a lunatic? Yeah. And then to watch her interviews and watch her 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 journey um in the old footage and, and then like the last episode where the, you show where she's she's working um in a hospice now. I mean this is a person who talks a lot of shit, yeah. like myself. Yeah. I respect the shit yeah. out of it. It's a woman. Yeah. It's a brown woman in the 80s who was going on these shows talking shit yeah. basically on, you know, it's, it's like if, you, if you're not of that age, like Phil Donahue, yeah. it's like CNN. It'd be like if yeah. someone goes on Anderson Cooper and yeah. like is like basically yeah. saying, kiss yeah. my yeah. fucking yeah. ass. Yeah. She was on Crossfire. She didn't give a fuck. Yeah. Yeah. She was like 
pre Jerry Springer before Jerry she Springer. Was, was like, she yeah. was like a one man <laughs> Jerry Springer. Yeah. Like she was bringing the fucking yeah. noise. Like she'd be a like she'd yeah. break the internet. Yeah. There was like she was. Yeah. that. Go- I mean, right. now there's plenty of people that do that. Right. So how did you get in touch with Sheila? Sure. Um, and, and what was the first time you met her? And just yeah. give me your whole sort of sure. Sheila takeaway. Absolutely. So, yeah, like you just said, you know, we had watched hours of archive of her just eviscerating these talk show hosts and people in the audience. And, you know, we were immediately drawn to her. She was witty. She's charming. She's funny. Um, and so we we did some research on Google and came across this kind of hospital. Google center. is a motherfucker, huh? <laughs> it is, man. <laughs> but, yeah, we found these, like, little health clinics that she runs in Switzerland. And we didn't even know. It's like, is it the same Sheila? Is this the right person? But, you know, we saw Sent off an email, and I think within a few days we got a response and got her on the phone. And was the email saying we're making a movie? It, it was, was a little bit, just like, hey, we're we'd love to talk to you about it this. Was pretty early on, and I mean, but we had talked to Oregonian officials, federal officials before this, just just trying to <laughs> put our toe in the water of the story. And I mean. How yeah. do they describe she? Yeah, I mean, the the this was an exact quote. They said she was pure evil. Was was how they described her to us. And so they mean that sincerely. Too. Sincerely, because yeah. of the crimes that she committed and which other were people. what. Basically, basically, what she ended up pleading guilty to was there was an attempted murder on the ranch of Baguan's doctor, a man named Dave Arage. Uh, good looking guy. A good looking guy, not a bad looking guy. He, he looks like the most interesting man in the world. Like, <laughs> right. if he was, you know, he had the beard, yeah. he got the hair, yeah. tall. Yeah, there was also a conspiracy, which was an assassination a plot to kill the U.S. attorney for the District of Oregon, Charles Turner. Uh, that was a, a guilty plea, was a part of that. And there was also putting salmonella in salad bars in 10 restaurants in the Dalles, Oregon, which is a town in Oregon where 751 people got salmonella poisoning. It's considered the largest biochemical terrorist attack in U.S. history. It should be noted, Sheila did what was called an Alfred plea, which is I'm pleading guilty, but it's only because you have enough evidence to prosecute me. But it's kind of like I'm, a, I'm guilty on some of these things, but I'm not guilty on some of them. And she's obviously, she's been... She's never admitted to everything, but in our interview, what we found was she was willing to give us justifications for why shit happened the way it did without ever fully going on and fully admitting everything, which which totally lends itself to like credibility questions. Is she credible? Is she not? I think in Wild Wild Country, she comes off as someone that's reliable at times and unreliable at other times. But we were still interested in talking to her because she was such a decision maker as a part of the community. It seemed like stupid to make a documentary series on Roshni's Perm without getting Sheila's perspective in it. Yeah, but I I mean, as soon as we got her on the phone... She was a little heads in at first, but I think once we told her what we were kind of interested in, I think it became clear that she feels like she's never been given an opportunity or a platform to really say like her version of the events, what she was interpreting. And it's really interesting. I mean, <laughs> when you talk to her, I think there is maybe a valid argument that that they felt incredibly persecuted out there for their religious beliefs. They felt like they were dealing with a lot of bigotry, a lot of government overreach and trying to dismantle this community and this city. And it was really interesting to watch Sheila's progression as a young 17-year-old hippie girl who went to school in New Jersey. She went to college out here. She was part of the flower power movement. She's a fine artist. She does a lot of paintings. Oh, okay. Um, You know, she's really smart, really well-read. And, you know, and then marries this young American Jewish man. It's a, it's a it's a whirlwind romance that they have. And at 27 years old, she finds herself widowed. He passes away from Hodgkin's lymphoma and kind of after this passing, kind of dives headfirst into running this religious empire of this guru. And so she's had a real fascinating story to tell. And, you know, we, we kind of Mac and I talked like we weren't this wasn't going to be like an interrogation with her like we just really wanted to sit down similar how we're doing like hey you like let's no, this walk is a fucking through. interrogation yeah. guys don't worry don't worry <laughs> we, don't worry I'm, I'm just fucking softening you up this fucking this whole place is wired trust me the gates are shut but yeah and we so we we visited her twice before we even interviewed her you went to Switzerland went to Switzerland twice she's still on Interpol's list she never served. Times when, when she's, she's, still, she's on Interpol, which means she can't travel outside Switzerland because she never served time for her federal offenses. She only served prison time for her state crimes. And how long was that? How long? She ended up doing two and a half. It's a really legally complicated thing, but basically 
Oregon State filed charges against her and other Roshnish leaders, and they pled guilty and struck plea deals, and they served prison time in Oregon. Sheila has this really interesting story, which we weren't quite able to get into the series, but she basically got out a month earlier than the federal government thought she was going to get out on a, not like a good behavior, but she painted the interior of the prison, and the prison warden credited her 30 days of prison. So she gets out of Oregon State Prison, takes a flight to Switzerland before the federal government is able to organize their federal charges against her and other people. And basically, I, I didn't get the, 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 the details of it, That's but, interesting. but federal prosecutors told me that people were fired and that heads rolled because Mon on Sheila was got out 30 days early in prison, was able to take a flight to Switzerland, and they were never able to extradite her back to the United States That again. is interesting. Yeah, so, so, I, I wish I would have had 10 hours to tell Washington's <laughs> program. I feel like I tell these stories and I wish I would have had four more episodes. Dude, to jump ahead, and I was going to ask this at the end, but I don't want to forget anything because you're just giving me so much information are you you have to you have to do it you have to do your version of a follow-up yeah. like at least like a year from now if it's like just a two hours thing because well, yeah. i'm sure you guys saw the staircase yeah they absolutely. did their follow-up right. i mean there's it's so a, many it's questions. incredible just how many people start coming out with their own stories though i mean we've been getting emails from so many people on all sides have of you thought issue. about it or are you like we've fucking you're, you're just, just like part getting, of us that's like this was four years like <laughs> i let's got go you make yeah. okay so there's let's no go plans. back to sports and let's do a fun sports right that seemed like nothing like like a like a two-hour so there's part of us that wants to do that but there is a part of people really feeling like, hey, here's some information that might be of interest to people. And so we're just kind of in the process of like vetting that stuff now. I got you. Some of it's absolutely insane and you have no idea if this is true or not. I got you. Some of it's more credible. And so, um, yeah, there definitely is um, more things coming out that I think if you enjoyed the series, you'd be really fascinated to know. Okay, so jumping back to Sheila, w one of the things that, that frustrated me about her and I was like, is this a fucking maniacal murderer? Um, or attempted murderer, because she didn't actually murder anybody. Right. Um, when you say she did her time and then leaves the country and goes to Switzerland, I mean, anybody would do that. Yeah. Well, not anybody. Not anybody do, would do that because, because um, you know, Jane, she came back, obviously, because she wanted to see, be with her son. You know, I mean, it's an understandable thing. You do two and a half years. Like one of the th one of the things that I respected about her and drove me crazy. She's unapologetic. Right. To this day, even sure. in the the older version of Sheila, yeah. and how old is she in the? She's sixty eight. She's 68. only what a life. Yeah. Today she's sixty eight. Yeah. Okay, so you know, obviously, when she's young, Sheila, and she's you know at, at the ranch, she doesn't give a fuck. Like she's ride or die. She's like, she's basically you know what she's like. She's like Tupac. To, to Rajesh <laughs> Suge Knight. Like, right, she's yeah, like on yeah, that Tupac yeah, shit. Sure. Like, yo, yeah, his yeah, fucking yeah. death row yeah. records come yeah. to death row records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's. Well, that's what's fascinating. Like, she really believed in what she was doing. I mean, like, 100%. You know, sometimes you see like Kellyanne Conway on the news and you're like, does she really believe what she's saying about Trump or is she just like. But Sheila's, uh, she really she's thug fuck, life. She's yeah, thug she life, thug dude. Life. She's down for it. Like a lot of people think she took the fall for this. She didn't rat out anyone when when it came time for her prison sentence. You know, she gave nothing up on the guru. Um, right, and so they had a, they had a breach. Yeah. So and they had a falling out even, and she still refused to give up any information. She's and so, ride or fucking she's die. Or die. So she's just really just fascinating character to talk to. But yeah, I mean, there is a lot of different interpretations. Like, is a lot of people are like, is she a psychopath? Is she not? And and it's been so interesting to hear different people's interpretations of like her journey and her character. When you guys are making this film, how are you processing not judging her? You're you're watching this old footage, and then then this person that you're seeing from 20 years ago, you meet in real life. And I don't care if it's 10 hours, 20 hours, when you're in front of somebody, sure. it's a different version. Yeah. You're you're seeing them jokes, you're seeing them burp, sure, you yeah. know, you're seeing them, you know, bumping, you're seeing an actual. And you're also thankful. Like you're thankful that she that they're sitting down and talking to you. Like there were a lot of people that dodged a lot of our phone calls and emails and had wanted no part of the series. Um and Sheila was like kind of yeah, she was a little badass about it. She was just like, she allowed two Americans. We had made an Oregon baseball documentary, so we kind of had this Oregon connection. She went to war with the state of Oregon, and she kind of allowed us just to come in and ask us whatever we wanted. So yeah, on surface character. level, you're like thankful for that, you right. know, and, 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 and that's helpful. I mean, the other thing is, is like, I, I totally empathize and I understand people who say like Sheila and the Roshnishi's arrival and presence in Oregon had a serious 
and um, a traumatic impact on my life in a very, very negative way. If they live next to Roshni's Purim or if they were poisoned in the Dows, I understand that, and I do. So I am the first to admit, hey, it's real easy for me who grew up in the 90s in Los Angeles to, and had and my life wasn't impacted at all by Mon on Sheila to go meet Sheila and, and, and trying to have an open conversation with her. I mean, again, I don't think that Chap and I actually truly felt like a real need to condemn attempted murders and poisonings. Like, that's obvious. Like, mm-hmm. that shit is bad, and no one should do that. But Wild Wild Country was intended for mature adults that could watch this series, know that that shit is bad, but then still be willing to kind of listen to someone talk about why they were pushed to do the things they were willing to do. That's hopefully part of the entertainment of Wild Wild Country. Right. You, it's good, interesting you said entertainment and adults, because now I'm thinking about, like, I, like one of the Twitter questions, mm-hmm. and I can imagine there might be other people, like, you're interviewing a person that could have killed this person or yeah. you're you know like this is like if it wasn't a like woman she doesn't deserve a platform or a microphone but, anymore but I think you have to deal with that, that a little bit but I truly feel like audiences are intelligent enough to know if they feel like a character is spinning them or if they feel like that they have I an totally agenda agree. and like I think that there's this need for audiences like they just want to be told what's right and what's wrong and they want to be make sure they're on the good side but I feel like if I'm watching an audience like when I watch Jinx like I could tell there's something off with Robert Durst and I can't trust everything he's saying I didn't need Jarecki to tell me that you know like I, I, give, I got you I give if you give it enough time on camera enough time on camera you're gonna feel where their holes in their arguments are where they're trying to justify certain things and that's hopefully part of the entertaining process of diving into this like long six hour stories you're not just being spoon fed like hey this is bad this is wrong you know like you're having to kind of figure it out for yourself and that's what we wanted to do you know how long did you uh, actually physically interview her um, how long were the sessions um, and where did you interview her? Our interview schedule, we spent five days with her. Did you did you know it was going to be five days? Yes. We, 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 yeah, that was what we kind of scheduled with her, and it was four hours a day. So we ended up with like 20 hours of total interview time. And we started from her being five years old in India to what she's doing now. So it was an entire like biography biography of, of her whole life. Um, and then we interviewed her kind of, she owns this two houses in Switzerland where she takes care of patients with dementia and those are Alzheimer's. her those so that's her she doesn't work there that's her that's her business she that has she a staff started. but yeah that's like her business which was pretty incredible yeah. i mean we didn't really get into it but after prison she moves to switzerland she learns to speak german from scratch at, at, at her in her later years she started off as a dog walker hmm. then she became a cleaner she cleaned houses as a maid for a while and then mm. through cleaning houses, she was taking care of this older couple. And that was kind of like her first client and started taking care of older people. And through them, kind of built this network of, of people with mental illnesses that she can take care of yeah, in their later one years. One of the questions that, because we wanted to show that not just to have this like, oh, Sheila's a great person type of thing at the end. But one of the questions that I ask myself is, does everybody deserve a second chance? And that's and, and, and there's right and wrong answers to that. It's like, regardless of your yeah. opinion on second chances. Does like everyone it, deserve a redemption story? story or not you know, or who's worthy of a redemption <laughs> mm-hmm. story i think is a really fascinating topic especially you know? in this day and age exactly because my like is louis ck right. like when is it for what's, sure like, when does how it, long is he in the doghouse for yeah. type of thing you right know? and it, it was like and and i think with the case i'm on on sheila if you feel like she doesn't then that that could be a legitimate takeaway um if you think like you know what maybe we are a society that's like yeah you do your prison time you're no longer really you, you know you pay your debt to society and if you want to rebuild your life you can go do that. And I That's will say this. Song. I mean, we spent a lot of time there without cameras rolling. With Sheila. With Sheila. Without even us knowing that we're around, Sheila works hard and those patients like love her. And so there's a lot of people that were watching this at the end going, oh my God, this is a horror show. This is terrifying. But our genuine takeaway is that she cares very deeply about her her clients and patients and does a very difficult job of taking care of these people was kind of our legitimate, genuine takeaway, even when cameras weren't rolling. Your this is a technical question. When you did your five days, four hours a day interviews with Sheila, how many cameras uh, were you using and, and did you do the interviews chronological order? You said you started off when she was seven sure. and like wh- when you guys worked together, yeah, yeah. like I'm, a, I'm interviewing 
to two of you. Right. And I know from when I'm doing a doc, you right. know, who's who's asking the questions? Sure. Which one of you guys? Yeah, so I we had a DP. We had two cameras running. So our DP, Adam Stone, who shoots all of Jeff Nichols' films, like Midnight Special and Take Shelter, and is yep. an incredible DP. Um, he was overqualified for our <laughs> okay. documentary series, okay. but we were but lucky he, to get him. <laughs> okay. He was on one camera. I was operating the other camera. And then Matt kind of sits in the interview chair and, and asks the questions. It's kind of usually how we do it. And if I hear something that I think needs repeating, I also do a lot of editing. So sometimes I have an ear for like, oh, they're going to need to repeat that or that's not going to cut together. So let's ask that. And I'll chime in every once yeah, in a while. Yeah, it's kind of how we started, actually, because I was a history major. I went to UCLA. I was like obsessed with nonfiction stories. But I would kind of see my like these professors that I loved write these 500 page books that no one was reading. So I was immediately interested in documentary film. Our whole family's from the film industry. I never really thought we'd get into it. But I saw a documentary as kind of this kind of type of nonfiction filmmaking that I was really interested in. Chap was always kind of tried and true filmmaker, like went to film school, learned right. to edit, learned how to shoot. And so we so kind he's of... the brains of the he, he, Exactly. He's like, he's technically very savvy and like I we, I leaned on that a lot. I got and you. so we kind of had this division of labor where it's like I would do a little bit more of the research and a little bit more of the putting like getting like learning the story and doing the interviews and then like chaps got I mean it's so helpful to have him there because like as I'm doing the interviews he's the first person that I look to at the end and be like do we get everything do we, right. do we have everything that we need and then like whatever he tells me to like get again that always ends up making it into the show <laughs> it's like critical stuff that's like oh yeah we need that or when you guys are doing it did you break down the interviews with specifically Sheila because that probably was the most extensive in chronological order? Yeah, we kind of did an interesting way. The first thing that we did before we even started our interviews was we basically wrote six scripts for each episode. Beginning, Wait, explain that. Explain. So basically, it's an archival story. We know the beginning of the story. We know how it ends. And so we knew that we were doing these six one-hour episodes. So we really like wrote a treatment for each episode. Here's the opening scene. Here's your page eight moment. Here's the end of the first act. Oh. Here's here's your cliffhanger at end of episode one. Here's your conclusion. So we really like structured based it. on the the archival footage. Based on the and just the research. There's, we read like over twenty books on this. We read a lot of the gurus' books. We're doing so pre-interviews with characters. Pre-interviews with a lot. Of characters, pre-interviews off camera, like off, off camera. yeah, just research, just like hey, I want to, we're gonna go grab but, lunch, you know, we're one of go these, grab, yeah, yeah, you know, take our task like, cam recorder, got and you, go got around you. and just talk to people. That's that's interesting, that yeah, you, because and it, it really is like people. I love documentaries <laughs> that people are making where it's current, modern day, and it's unfolding. And like I would say, one of the great benefits of being able to being an archival documentary filmmaker is you get to kind of structure it. With Battered Bastards, we were able to structure it in three acts. Yeah. This was much different. We were able to do it in six one-hour episodes. But it is a little. I think some people are of the belief like I just want to talk to you for the first time on camera so we can get something fresh and new and that's definitely like how some people attack these interviews but we feel like if we can get a little more information beforehand it helps uh, us inform our narrative like how the narrative structure of the show will play out and because you know that it's so much exactly. and there's so much I, that's so that's when we do our interviews we know like hey these are big or this is a huge archival video section like we need Sheila to talk about the world festival because that's a huge moment in episode three and so we kind of do a mix of just chronological yeah. and just making sure we're hitting our bullet points. Yeah. And, our and you totally stay, I mean, there's stuff like John Silvertooth and overalls, like when he started off a, a story with, well, I've never told this in public, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. It's like, you know, like, so it's like, you have to be open to, you can't be controlling. It's like, you're essentially. Yeah, we're pretty freewheeling too. We're not like totally strict yeah, to our questions. If someone's going off on an interesting tangent, you know, we're, we might dive into that as well. Yeah, you play with that. And it's like, I think that we called our scripts like the Bible that we had made. We're like, well, like, and, 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 and the Bible that we had was a little bit plot for plot. And it ended up being pretty accurate to what's in the series. I think the area that we couldn't really plan for was just the personal character arcs and development of mm -hmm. our talking heads because they really were our cast. And so that was something that we definitely stayed open to. And then, I mean, the story was just so complex that it was one of those things. <laughs> where we almost ended up with as many questions at the end as we started with, which was just kind of the nature of this wild ass story where, you know, it's a lot of different perceptions of the same event that happened sort of thing. When, when you guys were filming, uh, I mean, I'm sure you had a bunch of them, but do you remember like, you know, when I've had the pleasure of making docs, there's been a handful, like to this day, I could recall them oh shit moments yeah. where the way they're telling a story and you're just like this is gonna be in the this fucking movie and gold. you're just like you know you can <laughs> feel it it's, you can feel it in the room sometimes it's really amazing like you can just you feel that sense of energy and I think like 
one of the one of the first ones that happened, which was just absolutely insane, was when we were interviewing the assistant attorney general of Oregon, Bill Gary, and he was explaining to us how their real attempt to poison the water supply <laughs> with the fuck with the beaver, <laughs> with the beavers. yeah, and the so, beaver in the blender. Yes, so basically they they. What they ultimately ended up doing was poisoning salad bars, but their first attempt, which what they really wanted to do, was they wanted to poison the entire water supply of this city with some sort of bacteria or salmonella um, so that enough people would get sick on election day that they wouldn't be able to vote. It was a way to control the election. And so they trapped beavers. Which are like have a really bad bacteria in them, apparently. And known for I didn't when know you about say it. they no. trapped beavers, who trapped beavers? Okay, well, this is a, yeah. So none of this is 100% <laughs> known as fact, but according to the, the, the attorney, assistant attorney general, he told us that, Rosh Nishis or Sanyasins, people of this religious movement, trapped beavers on their commune. And then they took the beavers and then they were going to put the beavers, the live beavers, into the water supply. And through that, the bacteria and salmonella will infiltrate the water supply. The, pro- How, the problem that they ran the into. The problem that they ran into when they got to the water tank in the middle of the town was that the opening, the gap between the lid. Was covered with a wire was mesh. Was covered with wire and mesh. So they couldn't get the live beavers in there. So he's just telling us this is very, very nonchalantly, very matter of fact. <laughs> and this factly, wasn't in the pre interview. This was not <laughs> in the pre interview. <laughs> and he said, you know, they couldn't get the beaver. They couldn't put the beavers in. And so what they did is they went back and they put the beavers in blenders. And then they blended the beavers to a pulp and then took the blended beaver pulp back to the water supply and poured the blended beavers into the water supply. And that was truly one of the most insane things I'd ever heard in my life. And I was on the camera and I remember just doing like a slow turn to Mac and not even saying anything. And we both just made eye contact contact. (laughs) without breaking face. And like, it's something only brothers can do, but we were just looking at each other like, what the fuck did that guy, did did he just say? You know, like we were just so flabbergasted. Yeah, and so what he said, which was really interesting, because as soon as he, he, I mean, he kind of knew what he was doing. That's so far fucking out. He fucking, he knew what he was doing, and he landed it perfectly, and he was like, again, he's like, I have no idea if that's true or not, but he said it was told to me by someone who was there. And 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 that was as deep as he was and, willing and, and, to go. And that was as deep as he was willing to go. There's no other really, information. No, we were. We, it was in like an an affidavit. But he said it wasn't just what was put in the affidavit. It was he was talking about his own personal interviews with people who had pled guilty to stuff. And he said that this was a story that was told to him. He wouldn't name who, but he said it was told to him by someone who claimed they were there. No. So at, I, I, again, it's like I wish we could have gotten like hardcore analysis and fact from there. But that was as, that was as deep as we could get. On Did that you one. either? While you were making it, after, since the movie's come out, ask Sheila, Sonny, or Jane about the fucking beavers. They we don't know. They would not. No. Uh, they, I, we I actually, because Bill Gary was interviewed. And which guy is Bill Gary? Bill Gary's the assistant U.S. Okay. attorney general who told us the story was actually after we had interviewed all the Sonny Yeah, Austin's. it was at the end, so there was not if something that we If you saw Sheila about. again, like, let's say, you know, you saw, would, would, they, I think would they, you be curious to ask I about? would be curious. I would definitely I, ask, I, I but they I would 100% would say. say. Well, she's like, like, not saying. She's ride or yeah, fucking yeah, die. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. But don't, wouldn't you want I, to, like, 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 like follow up? Be her follow up. This is something that I think could be legitimate, is that I think that they felt that the people who were cooperating with government officials were kind of throwing the kitchen sink at the That's whole a creative community. kitchen yeah. sink. To try it. <laughs> that ain't just a kitchen sink. That's but a way the out attempt, there shit yeah, to come exactly. up with. The attempt was to try and get you know their prison time as down as little as possible. So it was kind of like, I mean, literally, the reason we put this section in, it's called Rumor Hotline. And the Oregon state government officials funded a rumor hotline because they were oh. having such a hard time figuring out what was truth and what was fact. And we had that same problem too. I mean, this was a story of essentially 2,500 people who lived on this commune. It was impossible for us or anyone to know exactly what happened on the ranch at okay. all times when you get vastly different contradicting no, effects. It. And so I'm sure I feel like I can go out of limb and say that this would be a story that would be 100% denied yeah. by a lot of people. But again, it's like this guy's telling you it and he said, well, this was told by maybe someone who was there. I don't know someone that would tell that yeah, story if the they were there. Line being was, a documentary filmmaker, you know, like, it's not proven. It's not known. They obviously, of course, would deny it on the other side. But you have an AUSA he said it in saying a, he yeah. heard it. And so, you, you know. You got to like, put that in the movie. It's, like it it's too in, far right. fucking out. <laughs> out there, yeah. Sure. And it kind of is. It, to me, it was symbolic of how much stuff can be embellished or how much mm. stuff can be not. Mm. It was a little bit of the truth and f- fiction that was inherent in Wild Wild Country, I think. Okay. Um, let me see. Okay. The homeless people. I have to say, as far as documentaries or, or just regular uh, narrative films, 
was one of the wildest twists I've I'll never forget seeing because I that was I think my <laughs> wife might have been up to that part when she first started watching it and I was like screwing around doing something and I came in and, and then she goes, yo, you got to see. And, she's, and I'm like, and then I'm watching the tapes of the homeless people and she's like, now they're drinking beer and they're, they're fucking poisoning the beer or they're, they're medicating the beer. And, and I was like, what the fuck? And that's when I started watching it. <laughs> the, uh, the recruiting of the homeless people is so far out. Such a, see, this is when I'm like, these motherfuckers are not, this is not yoga meditation. Like, this is an agenda here. And we're going to go to, you know, she says it, you know, play with the cracks, yeah. play with the, you know, play of the law. Loopholes. Loopholes. Yeah. The loopholes. Sheila says it, I think, in archival footage, right? No, in our no, okay. in, in, in yeah. she, she, said, she said, if you're not finding the little loopholes, the gaps in the law, then it's your loss. Uh, right. And see, <laughs> that's where I'm like, this. that's not a very spiritual practice, no. but... You know, all, all but Sheila th- never claimed to be spiritual, which was really interesting too. Which is what we talked about in episode one, which we didn't really know. And we were interviewing her, and she's like, "Dude, I didn't give a crap about the meditation. Meditation was a product. Meditation is what I sold to Westerners to come to build Bhagwan's empire." So she was all about the business. She liked running the infrastructure. Sheila was not there for spirituality or for enlightenment. I mean, she she claims that she fell in love with this man, this guru, and she wanted to be the right hand woman, the right hand man, and make it all happen. And so. So that's what I kind of that's when I kind of found her really interesting is like, well, there's so many uh, layers to the story. You know, Sheila has a completely different reason for being a part of this movement as from everyone else. Okay. That's one of the, the best things you just said to me. I didn't know that that specific thing. I mean, I, it was obvious by her actions that she was about her business, but to say but I didn't realize and maybe I missed it in the actual film that she was like, I'm essentially a business woman. She was the only sannyasin who the guru said didn't need to meditate because Sheila hated meditation. So she got personal. She would fall asleep during the meditations and it would piss a lot of her fellow Roshni. She's off. This is the gold right here. Apparently apparently Bhagwan gave her a pass on falling asleep and uh, during some of the meditations. I mean, yeah, Sheila wasn't very interested in, in kind of the, I guess what they would say, walking the path of enlightenment. Now you said she fell in love with him in the breach in one of his his interviews where he was he came out of his silence. Bhagwan said, and 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 this is again this is I was like if I'm a follower like this is not spirituality yeah. when he says she uh, why would I fuck did he For say sure. fuck yeah did he say fuck he or said, sleep with uh, sleep with why would I sleep with she's a bitch. Uh, Right. And she, why would I say, exactly. if, I, if I'm a spiritual person, right. if I'm in yoga class at right. my fucking, you know, my, my power <laughs> yeah. yoga class in the valley on a Sunday and they start talking like this, right. I walk out, even right. me, well, and I'm a savage. Yeah. I'm like, this yeah. isn't the fucking, I'm trying to do my downward yeah, yeah. dog. I'm trying to get me. I think what's so fascinating. And they're like clapping. Yeah. I'm like, this is, you were. Well, when we talk to Sanyasins, ex followers and even current Sanyasins, you have to remember that he had taken a vow of silence. This guru had been silent for four and a half years. He was supposedly in his silence, they felt was coming up with the master plan for them, for their religious movement, for what would lead them to enlightenment. That's why they were all out there in the desert. And so I think for this moment when these followers here for the first time, our master, our guru is going to break his silence. He's going to come out and he's going to, they felt like he's going to come out and tell us what the next movement is in this grand experiment. They were looking to him for guidance. And he basically comes out and just throws Sheila completely under the bus. And with very unguru, unspiritual like language. Absolutely. So, yeah. And I think you see very much that this is like a man who feels like he's been burned. He like, you know, he's a human being just like the rest of us. And I think that was for a lot of sannyasins a turning point for those that started questioning what's really going on here. What am I a part of? Is this worth it? Like we're supposed to be – they. When you talk to sannyasins, their goal was to transform the consciousness of the planet. And they say that very seriously. Right. That, seriously. that, that was their ambition. To, they felt like if we build enough of these communes around the world, mm-hmm. we will transform the consciousness. And so back to the Bhagwan breaking his silence and, and calling Sheila a bitch and claiming that she was jealous because he never slept with her. And I think was a very confusing time for everyone in that movement. You know, we could talk about this story, uh, you know, in, in all this sort of like, you know, like it's like Nat's Landing or like a soap opera. Yeah. But I mean, it bare bone question. 
Did they have a, a sexual relationship? Did they have a, a, a personal relationship? It was denied. Both of them said that they never slept with each she other. Said so that Sheila said that okay. and Bogwan well, also said that. It. So yeah, and I kind of believe it too. I take them both at, at their word. We didn't get into then, it, but Bogwan had a longtime caretaker slash girlfriend named Vivek that lived in his house with him that w- was with him even in the India days. And so they were together for a couple decades. Okay. And so it was told to us that was like his long time partner. Said, if she said it, then I, I, I have yeah, to believe that it. Was, right, exactly. Yeah, I never, and I really never heard any differently from anyone, which was like, oh no, they both are kind of in on this little They just secret. had this intense thing. It had to be some sort of intense yeah, it relationship. Is, it's like it, it, gurus in India have kind of personal secretaries that are like these fall on the sword type of commitment devotions. I mean, it's a little bit of a tradition of Mm -hmm. this in India and we weren't quite able to get into the documentary but Sheila's father, who was a part of like this kind of independence movement, he was part of Gandhi's independence movement, was old, was all, I think a little bit older than Bhagwan, but really respected Bhagwan kind of as this up and coming philosopher guru who's provocative Ah. and pissing a lot of people off. I mean, Sheila's father was really prominent member of Gandhi's inner circle and also spent time in prison for his involvement with Gandhi. Did I miss Gandhi. this in the no, film? We okay, cuz yeah, I'm like yeah, fuck it's why things am I doing we weren't this? able to include, but Sheila grew up seeing her father as a freedom fighter who fought alongside Gandhi um, for his for the independence movement, served time in prison. That makes and that was a, lot a of huge sense pivotal moment in her life and I think she felt that she was doing the same thing with Bhagwan. I, I hate to make the Tupac yeah. comparison again but <laughs> Tupac's mother yeah. spent time in prison yeah. uh, you know after doing stuff with the Black Panther so yeah. I, I, I think that you it's know influential. like there's no other rapper that's like yeah. Tupac but Sheila sure. right. is like uh, the, the Tupac. Yeah. Alright going back to the homeless people <laughs> did you try to track down any of them yeah. for interviews or was that impossible? We found two homeless people. It was really impossible. One, because they all took Indian names, sannyasin names once they came on the ranch. So it's very hard to track down what even their American English names were. Um, and it wasn't just something that people were advertising about themselves in their past. Not only that they were like home, it was just a little bit. Most one, of our we were able to see secretive through, about and, it. Like just through tons of Google search, I was able to track down one homeless person. We And we ended up finding two. Neither of them wanted to go on camera and talk. But I did find their experiences really fascinating, and I'm happy to share that. One was, um, you know, down and out, homeless, alcoholic, you know, just totally out on his luck. Took this bus from Northern California up to join this community. Um, and talked about it in incredibly glowing terms. It said it turned his life around. He got off. He got off alcohol. He wasn't drinking anymore. He actually went after this whole experience. Went back to grad school, got his master's in theology, and became wow. um, a pastor. And so, he's so you not, met the guy? We talked on the phone. Okay, but we he have, sounded like a nor- like he sounded um, like a sane person. Sane person yeah. went back, got his master's degree. So he works in a religious community now. He's a pastor, and very much credits Osho's teaching, Bhagwan's teaching, for helping get him back on his feet. But because of what he's doing now, just wasn't really interested in talking to camera. The other one was actually a really bizarre moment that Mac and I were filming in antelope and we were filming the flagpole that they have in the middle of the town right next to the post office and this car drives up and this man gets out of the post office and goes inside and his son was sitting in the driver's seat and the son said hey what what are y'all doing out here you know like what do you and we told him we're filming this story on Roshni's Purim and he said no way my dad my dad was a member of that group and I was just thinking like he was a a follower of Sonny Austin but this is in the middle of antelope he said he said my dad was a part of that and I thought that he meant like oh maybe his dad was on the antelope city council maybe he was on the school board like i just thought like oh definitely so start not talk, i immediately start talking to this kid and he's like no my dad was a homeless man in northern and, california in northern california also and and took a bus up there and joined it and i was like wait you guys are living in antelope now and he's like yeah my dad never talks about it because we moved here like 10 years ago my dad remembered the area moved back here wow and he was also someone that despite knowing now in modern day that they were tranquilized with Haldol and poisoned, also spoke about it as like 
an incredible time. We're like, yeah, we did work on the ranch, but we got free food. We got free clothes. They provided us health services. And he felt like it was a positive takeaway too, um, even despite knowing that they were used basically for, for voting purposes. Yeah, I think a lot of these guys, because those were the two modern day ones that we spoke to, but we did have like hours of interviews with people in the time. And even the news stations would follow up with homeless people who had left the ranch afterwards. Oh, yeah, off, right? so we had kind of these all, like hours of archive interviews and it seemed to be that even the ones that weren't thrilled with their experience at Roshnish Purim were equally as resentful towards America in general as a oh. country that they felt had completely abandoned them in terms of like I was a Vietnam War veteran I fought for this country and I got the only helping hand that I ever got in my life was these people dressed in red who allowed me to come be a part of their community for a couple weeks. And it was just a, a fascinating pers perspective no, to I'm, listen I'm to these I'm sure people. there's homeless people that feel differently, but those were the only two that we were talking to. Yeah, and we, and we were able to really them. wanted to get them on camera, but they were, there was just no way they were going to get on camera and talk about it. Again, with going to the, to, to the way the homeless people were, in my opinion, they were inevitably... Uh, they were used, and then when they were, when it was found that they couldn't use them, they kicked them Discarded, off. Discarded, yeah. You know, because the, the, the story of uh, Sheila talking about the one guy attacking her, that's right. of a home, one of the homeless that's people. The homeless so what happened? I mean, this was basically right when Reagan defunded all the mental institutions in America. So there was this influx of mental people, illness. mental illness, leaving these mental institutions, um, living on the streets with severe mental illnesses. And so, you know, when the Roshanishis were rounding up this home, these homeless people, there was no sort of checking these people out for who might be good for the community. They were taking anyone and everyone that was over the age of 18, an American citizen, and could vote. And so, you know, within weeks, thefts went up on the ranch, crimes went up, assaults, sexual assaults on the ranch. I mean, it was pretty soon that within weeks of busting in 5,000 homeless yeah. people, the entire... And uh, the entire community kind of began falling apart right. from and, I mean, the and inside. All, the, the, because we talked to a lot of sannyasins that we, they're called Rashanishis, but they, they, they call themselves sannyasins. Sorry to, the, we kind of use them inter, inter exchangeably. But um, like what they were telling us was they would see buses of homeless people coming into the community and it was so far away from their kind of peaceful meditation, yoga ambitions and ideals that you're, I believe that your average everyday Roshni, she saw this and was like, this is the beginning of the end. Like the, at least that's what they told us. Mm. They were like, we look back at this and we could not believe that this was what our leaders in our community, this was the plan that they had. So I think even from the get go, there were a lot of just everyday run of the mill Roshni, she's on the commune that were not thrilled about their utopia ter being turned into kind of a, a homeless shelter for mm -hmm. back of a letter. And word. also, I mean, just to be fair and honest, a lot of the homeless people did stay until the very end. So the ones that were kicked out were ones that, you know, were creating some sort of commotion inside the community. I mean, even at the end, you see two or three homeless people that we show in episode six <laughs> talking about how they don't want to leave. Right. And so just to be fair, it wasn't like they were, I mean, not that there's a, a way to be fair. I mean, what they did was awful bringing yeah. them in and discarding them, but there were numbers of homeless that did stay until the very end. Yeah, it was just oh. really complex. <laughs> like, almost every part of the story because it was just, the numbers were large. You're talking, right. It was a permanent population around 2,500 that lived on the ranch, and then worldwide, you're talking 30,000, 40,000 sannyasins, and then even homeless people, you're talking 5,000. So 5,000 like of them came 5, in. 5,000 of them so they came in. So they outnumbered like the amount of people that were already there. by two to one. Yeah, I mean, wow. the, the, I mean it, the plan was, there was about 12,000 Wasco County voters, um, eligible voters, uh, for this 1984 November county elections. And um, they knew that they, they couldn't quite get those numbers. They couldn't quite get to 12,000. Um, an interesting little factoid is that the uh, voter participation rate in Wasco County for that 1984 election was 93%. It was the highest of any county in the nation. It's interesting because, uh, you, you know, obviously what happened in uh, Alabama, you know, when, when people are clear <laughs> and have a clear-cut agenda and are clear on who's running and why they're running, uh, they vote. They turn yeah. out. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Uh, you know, whether e that or, you know, like even in Alabama, it's like you're like, it's between these two people, these are their yeah. agendas, 
And motherfuckers well, yeah, come out. The average voting rate for the nation that year was like below 50%. It was like 48 or 49%. So for a county to be in 93% and was just Kind of one the of the most fascinating things that I found in that whole thing was this kind of statewide rejection of all new voter registrations. Which, but, but couldn't they, I, you know, it's like, what did you think of that? Because in my opinion, like, well, that's their rights. I'm like, this is a fucking, this is a con here. Yeah. These, <laughs> these, this is not their rights. But this they're is following a, the letter of the law. It was so, 20, yeah, day, right, it was 20 day voter. Like, like Sheila, vote I think Oregon. at a certain point was like, fuck this. Dude, I am gonna do like like the elite. That was like just to be honest. To me, that's almost like one of the most terrifying things because you expect the Rajnishis to bend the law. You expect Eastern Oregon's to bend the law to their advantage. But if the law is 21 days in the state of Oregon and you can vote, and you have people that fought in the Vietnam War, fought for this country, living in this commune, and they're being told that they can't vote. Mm. I mean, that's a to I, me I, I, that was like if you don't like the law, change the voter uh, residency requirement right. laws. You can't just switch it whenever well, you feel no, that like was it like at because the last like moment, obviously you know? what some of the Rajnishis did in, that were in kind of Sheila and Sheila's cohort the illegal shit they did is like okay that's obvious that's illegal it's the shit that they did that was technically legal that is sometimes the more terrifying stuff where it's mm -hmm. like they incorporated as a town which meant they're allowed to have a police department that they can send people to the Oregon State Police Academy get credited as police officers and then they're legally allowed to kind of buy these almost semi-automatic like AK-47 assault, assault rifles and arm their legal police force in their community is and that, then use are it. you still allowed to do that to this day? If you're an incorporated town you are you're legally allowed to have a police force a fire department you can tax your base you're allowed access into oregon statewide taxing pool money that the whole state taxes all their citizens for as a city you're allowed to tap into that pool and use some of that money to fund some of your public services i um, i don't know what other states are i've only researched this in oregon right. but it's and 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 that was kind of at the heart of the story was the political power that you get if you can get 150 people to say they want a city that was a game changer in the is story. Is that just in Oregon? That Oregon was 150 people. Yeah, I oh, I there. It's basically a rule. There are some states are called home rule states, which if you're a home rule state, and I think like more than half of the United States states are considered home rule states. It's like a, a small amount of people. It's like 150 people, 200 people, 300 people can sign a petition and then you're allowed to petition your county government and then your county government usually has a voting commission like three people that will rule on whether to grant you an election and then if you're allowed Jesus. to have that election then you're allowed to decide whether you want a town or not that's usually the process but the Roshnishis was such an unusual case because once they got granted the election to have on their ranch it was like 154 voters to nothing voted that they wanted to have a city and right, then there was, was nothing easy. they could do that's what's terrifying about the story is all the legal shit that they did I got that you. was still uh, I mean they became an 800 pound gorilla in the state of Oregon. Well, I think it shows how easy like the fabric of our institutions can be challenged. I mean, we like to think we live in America and voting rights and police forces and all these things are like these sacred institutions. But if you want to like fuck with the system and you want to find the loopholes, it's not that hard to do. And I think that this series is a little bit of a warning sign of like what can really happen in our country if you get a group of devoted people that want to kind of bend the system towards their way. You know? I, I, I agree. Um, all right. Because I've kept you guys. I want to just rattle off a couple of questions. The red clothing. I'm sure you've asked, you've been asked this. Not what, that much, actually. Not about the red clothing. <laughs> not too many people. We can so get into it. There, yeah, there was a couple of reasons. Why red? Red was supposed to be the colors of like the rising sun, like in the morning. It was supposed to be a new start, a new day, a new beginning, like a, a, a new sunrise in the morning. Um, There's another kind of explanation, too, that I think is really interesting, which this could be getting too deep in the weeds, but I'll try and get through it quickly, which is the Roshnishis call themselves neo sannyasins, and there's a sannyasi or like it's a called sannyasi tradition of rejection it's asceticism and it's dudes wearing orange robes that are incredibly impoverished and that's their enlightenment in They're, india in it's india, a long sorry. tradition there's that long tradition in india of and sannyasi and what was interesting was bhagwan as a provocative very controversial guru kind of appropriated the orange clothing and it was insanely controversial clothing. in india it would be like someone gave me this analogy it would be like if you saw a couple of young 20 year olds wearing like a priest 
police collar and priest clothing running around your city kind of making out doing sexual shit to one oh. another and you'd be like that is that's 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 controversial that's provocative that's you're not supposed to put on a priest collar I and then you. act very unpriestly like I got and you. that's kind of what they did in India which was to, as westerners we don't really we don't see that we just but see that's a bunch how of, he was but viewed. that's how it was taken in India but then the other thing was these kind of sunrise colors new birth new age thing and but, then also I mean a lot of anti-cult people will tell you like that's a way to like get rid of someone's individuality and their individual identity and like you become part of the group instead of uh, an individual mm. so that's you know what a lot of anti-cult people have said um, and then Baguan also said like it's a meant to be provocative spiritually for you where you have to face your friends you have to face your teachers you have to face your family and say look this is who I am now like and you have to come you really have to like that was in his writing that was, that was called writing. a device and devices are kind of a part of this There's, devices are supposed to be external struggles that you have internal spiritual growth through and so there was this big mystic guy named like George Gurdjieff and like a Gurdjieffian device would be this like Gurdjieff would make you dig a five foot hole and it'd take you all day and you'd get your hands bloodied and blistered and then he'd say all right fill it back up fuck. and then you'd be like fuck like that is awful and like and and it was supposed to be this external struggle so i'm not saying that i believe this but when when, when i would talk to a lot of sannyasins they would say the whole experiment of rashnish perm was a big device we were supposed to build this 125 million dollar utopian city and it was supposed to collapse in five years and we were supposed to have internal spiritual growth through that struggle and uh, it was a device but, for um, it, which I'm is really fascinated by because i'm curious like there, I remember there was a time where I was growing up where I was like, I want to be a filmmaker, but I'm uncomfortable calling myself a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Like when people ask you, like, what do you mm -hmm. are? And you're like, I haven't done anything. And like, mm -hmm. as an actor, I'm, I'm sure, sure. it's you like, you know, have, like, when did you call yourself an actor? Like at what point? And so did you ever have a problem with that or no? Was it always no, easy for you? Artist. 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 Yes. Yeah. Like I, actor, yeah. I was fortunate. Sure. Like I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm acting I motherfucker. Like, yeah, I, I made $320. Yeah. I made $320 in my first movie. But I'm so, it was the term artist. Artist is harder. Which for us, it was documentary filmmaking. It was like, what do you do? Or it's like, are you a filmmaker? And it's like, yeah. And so I think that was the same thing. Like, are you a sannyasin? Are you spiritual? And wearing the clothes was forcing you to say like, I got you. I'm a filmmaker. I'm an artist. I'm a spiritual person. It's I like, it was you. a little bit of a fuck you to the world, but it was like taking ownership over a decision you made in your life. Okay. The disco on the, the grounds of the compound, there was a disco, there was a club. Did they charge people? To get into the disco? I don't think so, no. <laughs> Basically, they, their disco that they... Okay, so they had a couple things that were year-round, and then they had a couple things that were temporary for the World Festival that they would throw. Like, okay. they legitimately had a casino, but I'm pretty sure that casino was only a temporary casino license that they, they got, got like from the Oregon State. They got a special permit for those few from weeks. From the Oregon State government that would allow, like, legal gambling on their private gotcha. property and stuff like that. During and the I big think, celebration. I think exactly. I'm... I should know this, but I think you could get alcohol year round on the ranch but alcohol wasn't that big at Rashnish Purim but I know in the world festival like it it's was like, like a party it time. was like a party it was like it was like burnt yeah it was like pretty fun huh disco looked like the disco was hot it was like studio 54 playboy mansion that shit looked like it was yeah it was off the hook the the bogwan I mean it was a little bit of an interesting distinction that I wish hopefully we like the series makes but it's it takes kind of this type of talk to get to get it which is if you lived on the ranch year round, you were one type of sannyasin, incredibly devoted and committed uh -huh. to the. If you were a what I call like an international or global sannyasin, a lot of times you had a normal job. You're practicing, you were, but it was like yeah, but it was like come these two weeks in the world festival, you're gonna save up your money, you're gonna go hit up Rashnish Perm, and you're gonna go have a kick ass two weeks. I got and you. And they probably weren't as devoted to Bhagwan in the community. They were probably more normal people that just kind of had quote unquote normal lives, normal jobs. Uh, but this was a big part of their kind of summer vacation. The one of the, the, the part of the film you, you guys use the clips uh, from the ashram in Pune very intense looks like 16 millimeter footage I don't remember what episode but it's like they're in a rubber room yeah. they're naked they're screaming they're yelling it, it's like they're fighting they're fucking I don't know what the fuck is going <laughs> on what footage from the ashram in Pune documentary that was used in Wild Wild Country documentary what else is there? Because that shit looked sure. scary. Yeah. So what that basically was is that was a filmed uh, representation of what they called their encounter groups. And there were these very like new age therapies taking hold in like Berkeley and 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 the Esalen Institute and Big Sur. What's and it called? Oh, primal. It's called Primal. Primal Therapy yeah. and Counter Therapy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, you know, they 
they don't do them anymore, but in the no 70s, shit, these man. were popular, not just in, in... You can't do that anymore. You can't do yeah, it. I mean, Imagine it you put that scene. on Instagram. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. But, I mean, this wasn't just done in the ashram. This was kind of done all over. Australia had a big primal screen you. therapy. And the idea was, like, you let it out, man. Like, you have a tantrum. You go physical. You fight. Uh, you know, they they would get all naked and wither around together. And and then at the end, you've you've come to this, like, uh, eureka moment cathartic where... Release cathartic release. You know? So it very much was but like they were, therapeutically based. There it wasn't. Be noted, there like, was a method to the madness. Okay. It wasn't just. It wasn't just beating the shit out of people. I mean, it was. I mean, no, people right. got hurt. Like some people, yeah, like they, 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 it was very controversial in India. And eventually, it, from my thing that I heard and researched, it was one of the few times that Bhagwan and the sannyasins in general, like, kind of cave to the controversy in a sense of like we're not doing this anymore because we're getting too much bad press it's too out there. and it's too out there and so, visitors, they, I, that's so they stopped doing it in Roshnish Purim and as far as I know and I think a lot of people will tell you this it never happened in Roshnish Purim that's why I think they were so like disappointed with that documentary that it came to Portland and showed in Portland because it was like yeah this was a part of our past but we don't do this anymore we didn't really see the value in it so much but it was something that stayed with them even okay. to this day i mean it was we put it in our documentary because for antelopians it really was the well these are the new neighbors now you know and it was uh, the documentary itself not our documentary but ashram and Pune was such a critical document as a part of the roshnish history because it kind of always tended to follow the followers no matter where they went okay for me yes the lawyer guy naran he acted like all of them were just total victims nobody did anything wrong and what was your takeaway from interviewing him? Yeah. That was one of the most... Did you shoot that with two cameras or three two cam cameras? Two cameras. And we'll kind of like punch in every once in a while. Okay. So it looks like it can be multiple cameras. Okay, because it's, it, it's a good looking interview. Yeah. And, and, and also, like, I mean, he, he's an interesting character. But yeah. I was like, nothing, right. not a fucking ounce. Like, I think, no one did anything yeah. wrong, man. When you talk to Naran, I think he feels very strongly that obviously, like, Sheila's crimes and those within her circle are atrocious and horrible. His deep down belief is he believes that the crimes that Sheila created were a smokescreen for like uh, created a smokescreen created a smokescreen for the government to like overreach and persecute their group and the they, whole entire the group. whole entire like one group. bad apple and exactly. Osho specifically so and 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 there is probably a legitimate argument to be made where I think the federal government and the state government knew at some point that. All right, the way to deal with this whole fucking Roshnish problem, it's 2,500 people out there, is if we can just deport the guru, these people follow this guy wherever he goes. Mm. So it's kind of like, and there's a document where they said cutting off the head of the snake. I mean, that was kind of their own language that they use. So, and I think Naran feels that sincerely, that it was like, but the government, his thing is like, the government needs to be better than that. Sheila and her cohort and her crimes are one thing, but that doesn't mean that you get to attack the Pope because, you know, Catholic priests are doing shit that they're not supposed to be doing. That mm -hmm. was, that, not, not saying that I agree with that, but that was his but Yeah, I and mean, I think it's a total valid takeaway to say, like, hey, this group that you're a part of and this leader, like, was somehow all this horrible shit happened because of this group. But I think for those inside the group, there's so many fractures within that community that they feel so far removed from Sheila's crimes. Like they had no idea of what was going on. And that was the experience to most of the people we talked with. If you were not part of that like 15 person circle that Sheila controlled, they were really kind of naively oblivious to what was going on. I mean, obviously they knew about the homeless people coming in and taking, but as far as the political assassinations, the poisoning. Right, this is obviously not truly, being talked about at the morning they meditation. They felt right. like Sheila and her crimes fucked us completely because we you. were doing nothing wrong and we were building this incredible utopia and now we're all taking the fall and especially now they feel like their guru is somehow being associated with all this criminality which I think is really fascinating what did the guru know what didn't he know was Sheila taking orders was Sheila he, acting I, on her own and to this day take my, 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 I have to take say away. my take you know and I watched the film twice yeah. my take was he had to know something she, you know they're having these these private meetings every night up at the house like he has to know something. Yeah. You know, that was just my take. And then it's like, I'm like, when with the lawyer guy who like probably was the most frustrating one, I'm like, these things are poisoning people, assassination plots, uh, bringing in the homeless people. Like, you, you, none of this, just, just all coming from this one person. 
Come on, I, I, I just can't believe she's not running it up the flagpole or coming up with the ideas or, or, or totally on her own. It, you know, is it, it, you know, like the Jane, you know, he was, I was like, you know, I get his devotion, I get his sadness, yeah. but like, you know, like unless there was something cut out, you know, with him, I'm like, not a fucking, or, I mean, or just also like the president of the United States is responsible for shit that people below him do. And that's a little, it's like, if you buy into right. that yeah, type I think of level of responsibility, minimum, you have to say like taking a vow of silence at the most crucial right. time in like your movement probably not like the greatest act of responsibility. Right. You know, people were looking to him for guidance. They were looking to right. him for help and he was kind of nowhere to be found. And so, but the interesting thing about what did he know? What did he know? When we talked to like the federal prosecutors, they were like, we couldn't find any evidence that tied him to any of this. Like we couldn't find anything. Even the wiretaps, because they so said that's it was the greatest, like the So that's amount. what the lawyer says. That's his defense. The lawyer says like, if they had something on those tapes, like the, the FBI would have released it. They would have prosecuted him. I mean, they have the 10,000 tapes. There's no way they didn't go through all these tapes. If there was something damaging on him, because right, they really, right, right. they would have come out and gotten him, which is interesting, you know? You guys talk about the tapes in the film, but you don't, you never, because I thought, oh, this is going to be a device going forward. Did you get to listen to the tapes? We didn't. So there was a Freedom of Information Act that we that we filed and that was requested, but because like the participants in the wiretapping did not know that they were being recorded, the federal government is not allowed to release these tapes. And so no one's listened oh, to Oh, but them. they listened to it. They have They them. said they listened to it. It was a, It's a little bit murky on whether those tapes would even be admissible in court or not. Because but they did listen in terms of when they were when you were just saying that they... It, it, they I believe that very, they surveilled them the, quickly. The federal officials are very cagey. They won't tell you what's on, but they feel <laughs> very confident that had this gone to a trial, would have, we would have had the goods. Yeah. The other thing that was interesting was they told us is like they couldn't get anyone to flip on the guru. They're like, usually... Usually when you when you infiltrate these sects and these movements, there's so much resentment. Even the mayor guy, what was his name? They got him. That was the one guy. But David he didn't. Nav. He never flipped on the guru. He didn't flip on the guru. He flipped on Sheila, and you know, saying all the stuff that that Sheila did, and so. That's what they're saying. Like usually, these groups there's so much resentment and regret that it's really easy to get people to flip. But these people felt like this was like the best experiment of their lives, and were just not willing to give up anything. It, that was a, a, a I mean, a, a compelling, dramatic moment when he flipped, <laughs> and then Naran, Naran, yeah. Naran uh, you know, it's talking about it. I mean, it's it's yeah. like fucking you know breaking bad or sopranos yeah. or like it's like this he old. ratted you know yeah. i mean it's like he, he ratted no, he no ratted. one likes a rat even right. no matter like right. how bad things right. get you know right. and like no one respects a rat no one <laughs> likes a, a meditating spiritual rat either because it's like very true um oh so naran naran yes sorry what is he is he still a lawyer He's not. He's not practicing anymore. He lives up in the Northwest. And I think, you know, for the last years, has been really devoted. He's filed tons of Freedom of Information Acts. He has tons of legal documents that show, you know, collusion between what he believes is collusion between government agencies to kind of bend the law and get this guru out of the United States. And so he's been working on this book for a couple of years, which he feels is going to be in a very explosive tell-all book of what he's uncovered in his research. And he shared a little bit of, of that with us in our interview. Um, we showed some of those documents that, that the government was talking about at the time, <laughs> but I wouldn't be surprised if he's diving in even more. I'm sure. Us, I mean, because, you know, now's the time. Yeah. Um, when uh, the guru was arrested and, and, and left the country, um, I mean, that, that I, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this interview soon, but I mean, that whole process of like them flying him and landing him in Oklahoma City and made me think of Russell Westbrook yeah. and, you know, like that whole thing and, you know, like really go, sort of giving him the business. The question I have is when they finally, when he finally left Oregon, what happens to the ranch? Like how quick did, did people leave and, and how quick did it be go to, to be, you know, like sort of unfunctioning yeah and who owned it sure so they had within once the gut once the, the guru was arrested he ends up taking a plea deal um and agrees to leave the country and i believe it was in with when within weeks to a month people started filing out of there i mean their main purpose for being there was to hear him speak to be around his enlightened presence and so it became very clear that they could not sustain that community financially without the guru there and so they had many different corporations that they set up i think it was like <laughs> roshnish foundation international and they had a separate llc that owned the ranch a separate llc that did all the book sales a separate llc that owned all the rolls royces so it was very like financially complex how they set up their financial structure 
But eventually, they wanted to sell the entire ranch. They couldn't really find anyone to pay what they wanted for it. There was some talk of them turning it into a prison out there for a while. The, the state was looking at, yeah. and they it, would have loved the, 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 <laughs> to go. The Antelopians would have loved the ranch. Yeah, at that exactly. Point. But yeah, basically the insurance company that was given the mortgage to the Roshni, she's ends up taking it over and they end up selling it to Dennis Washington, who's like this Montana billionaire who's oh. made his money in kind of trains and not oil, but steel, I think in Montana. And uh, Dennis, I think, was very interested in the ranch because the one of the unique things is that the Roshnishis won on land use and their incorporation always remained intact. They lost on church state, which was in the courts. They lost ultimately saying that they did violate the separation of church and state. But on land use, they won at the Oregon Supreme Court. So Dennis Washington, I think, was interested in owning this piece of property that had an incorporated city attached to it. He kind of ran into some of his development problems. I think he had bigger plans to do with it. And then ultimately, after like a year or two, ends up gifting it to Young Life, which is kind of this youth Christian group that owns it today and are the current tenants. Did you guys go up there? Yeah, 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 we did. We yeah, filmed we, a little bit. Like when you see some of like the broken down A-frames and stuff, that's still on the property up there, up there in the hills. Were you, when you guys have finally got up there, like, to, like were you tripping out like, oh shit, like it's I would have been. really gnarly when you get out there. They still have the airport strip out there and the downtown mall that they built is still built and it's striking just how m much in the middle of nowhere you are. I mean, you're just surrounded by vast, vast mountains. And there's definitely like, I'm not a spiritual person, but there's some energy oh. that you get out there that's like, man, we're in the middle of nowhere. And this is a little bit weird, to be honest, you know. Um, and it's just seeing the remnants of the city. You'll see little things here and there that, you know, were that were built by the Rosh Is there a Starbucks in Antelope now? And there's I, there's no Starbucks now. No. Okay. There's nothing. Okay. It's like, yeah. I mean, right. they claim it never really recovered, you know? I mean, right. now it's down and out. I mean, I know it sounds horrible, but it's kind of like, well, probably a little bit drug infested. It looks like a little, they have meth issues. Oh. And, you know, it's become a town that's, you know. Struggling like the rest of kind of small towns in America. Exactly. All right, listen, my, my final question. Do you guys have any idea what you're going to do next? I, I know it's probably a, a shitty question, especially after you come off of something that's <laughs> caused such a, got such a passion to follow. Do you know what we you're going to do? We do. We work in development on two different documentary series that I think we're going to try and do kind of at the same time that we're also teaming up with Mark and Jay Duplass on. And we're just not talking about it yet because we're still getting the characters on board. Um, but one is like an entirely different story than, than Wild Wild Country. And then uh, I think one will be kind of a it, similar yeah, in-depth like, deep dive into culture, politics, power, art, um, yeah. something a little bit it's more. It's interesting because I think that like we didn't, we wanted to do the story of Roshni's Purim as a documentary series because it was great to the story. And I think that now we've become attracted to stories that we could tell again in a documentary series format. It's just such a bigger canvas and you're able to play with so much more room and space and like in wild wild country we got to tell a nike story and we got to tell like a you know a whole bunch of stuff that seemingly isn't related but you get to kind of work in and tell a bigger story so we're really excited about doc when series you get a platform like this people who feel like they have a story that they want to tell it becomes a more viable opportunity and so it's been interesting since the release that you know, we are starting to talk to characters that feel like we have information to divulge on these new stories that we're doing, which is really exciting to Just us. Just got to get more on board. The guy, what's his name? The Nike? The Bowerman. Bill Bowerman. Like, do you, did you, like, ask him, like, to hook you up with, like, some, like, rare Jordans? Like, <laughs> does did, he have yeah, that yeah. kind of hookup? I don't and is he fucking rich out of his, like, his father, I don't think so. his father created Nike. Co-founded Co Nike. Co-founded Nike. Co Nike. He invented the shoe. Bill Bowerman created the waffle shoe, the running shoe, you know, and then teamed up with Phil Knight. Apparently. To, but, like, in his crib, is there, like, fucking <laughs> Nikes and, like, they Jordans? Have their they're pretty they have a lot of history and his wife actually found the original waffle iron that they made the first nike shoe on which nike now owns i think in their portland headquarters yeah. or seattle but um no apparently bowerman will be the first to tell you apparently he sold stock too early so i got you. <laughs> all right well listen I, I i can't tell you how much of an accomplishment uh it is that you made this film so many more people are going to see it. So congratulations. I loved it. I'm obsessed with it. I uh, highly encourage everybody. I, I'm nonstop talking about Wild Wild Country. Thank so, you so much. congratulations. It was dope. This and was I, a great talk. Thanks for having us no, on. I mean, we love talking about it. Thank you so much for coming. Because I like like I said at the beginning, um, to be so excited about something and to have you guys here, uh, it's just like cool because it's like, you know, it's the power of sort of social media. So Absolutely. sincere congratulations and good luck on the rest Thanks of your so stuff. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Thank